Hello, and welcome back to our retrospective Apocrypha episode of Grizzly History. I am Michael Ruiz, and I am joined today with host of Grizzly History, Grant Parker. Howdy, howdy. And we wanted to kind of take a moment, of course, as, as you know, we go back and make these Apocrypha episodes as retrospectives to our main series episodes. But since we've just put out our final episode of Ends of the Earth, we thought it'd be good to take a moment. We'll talk a good bit about that final episode, but also just talk about the podcast as a whole, where we see grizzly history and where we think the future leads as well. So this is going to be a very open-ended conversation. So please don't expect anything completely formal. We just wanted to take a moment to sit down. So please imagine essentially just us at the end of, of our run here for about a year and a half, just taking a moment looking back, taking stock, um, discussing the themes of Ends of the Earth, of the final episode, giving a little bit of behind-the-scenes information about what we were able to do, what we were able to accomplish, and how that structure changed over time as our personal lives uh, adjusted at that point, and just some thoughts on where we would like to see things go in the future with Grizzly History. So with all that being said, what do you think, Graham? How do you feel now that we've we've finally put out the end of the ends of the earth. It is very welcome. I am looking back and I see that the first episode came out in November of 2021. We have literally been on this for about two years and it was definitely never supposed to go on that long. You know, we were working under this belief we'd be putting out about an episode a month. So sitting here at the end of two years, it feels good to finally put a, put a cap on it. I agree. And I think what's interesting is it's probably no secret to listeners, and I think I've spoken about this before on previous episodes of Apocrypha, but we took a lot of inspiration from Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. And I think about the episodes I've listened to of that show, where they talk about, hey, we thought we'd be putting out episodes once a month and we'd be, you know, more consistent. But as you go back and listen to their back catalog, you find these six-hour epic episodes and, and that sort of thing. We always focused on making sure we only did an hour an episode or roughly an hour an episode. And I think that's why you saw a lot of the uh, the kind of inconsistencies there. But two years, that is wild to think about. I, I was in a completely different place, uh, living in a completely different location. And um, I think we're both quite, uh, quite different at the end of two long years. But at the same time, kind of feels like it went by pretty fast. Yeah, I would agree with that. Definitely in different places and definitely didn't feel like two years. Yeah, and I think what's kind of fascinating looking back on it, because you really have one year where we were really full bore with it. You know, we had our Patreon that we had launched, and we had a number of social media accounts. We were doing the TikToks, the, the, the Grizzly History Shorts, if any of you are familiar with that. And we saw a lot of good success with that. But at the same time, you know, we're, we're both men in our late 20s. We, you know, a lot of things are going on. There's moving and familial things. So long story short, won't bore you with the details, but it becomes difficult to kind of coordinate and balance these different aspects. So once other things changed behind the scenes, we had to kind of slow down the rate at which we were putting out content. But at the same time, I know for myself and as well for Graham, we felt very strongly about finishing what we had started, about concluding the ends of the earth. And at the very least, if that tends to be the end of Grizzly history, which we will, we will discuss, um, Long story short, we do plan to kind of leave things on an open end, but let's say this is it. We wanted to make sure that we gave a satisfying conclusion to what we started out with. Yeah, we really appreciated the uh, listener support that we have gotten uh, over these two years, and we, we just felt that it was very important to just tell the whole story like we had intended to at the outset, and we're just glad that we could do that. So... Before we get too much into kind of the behind the scenes stuff, and, and we are going to be discussing that towards the end, we did want to focus on, of course, that final episode that we put out, the conclusion of Robert Scott's journey into Antarctica. And as you know, and, and we assumedly you, you've listened to that episode, if not, I would encourage you to pause this and finish the ends of the earth and then come back to this. But assuming you're here and you've listened to that, there is a very intentional decision that was made to conclude with Robert Scott. And it is in some part due to the fact that that does not end well. Robert Scott's entire party, essentially, his return party, lost their lives in their attempt to reach the South Pole first, realizing they hadn't, making a decision. I would argue 
pretty vested in hubris to try to get back first and made a bunch of decisions that felt very, you know, rushed and, and maybe macho and, you know, focused on the glory of the whole thing and, and seeing that end in calamity. I think when it comes to the ends of the earth, I think that theme, that theme of, of hubris and that theme of pushing things to its absolute limits for glory, for God, for country is really in many ways, a cautionary tale. And the thing I really like about the tale is that you see a real race between two different explorers and two different approaches to doing an expedition. And you can see why one succeeded and one did not. Yeah. And I think what's really indicative of the difference between the two traveling parties is the note that the Norwegians leave behind that is found at the South Pole by Robert Scott and others, where it seems that they, while understanding and cognizant of the fact that they have, they were in competition, and at the end of the day, only one person gets to claim that glory, it struck me that they were kind enough to leave that letter to wish genuine, you know, safe travels to their companions. And it kind of shows you that while we didn't focus a whole lot on the Norwegian end of the story, and I don't want to speak too authoritatively on what they were thinking because I haven't done a lot of research on that myself. I think through the actions that we've seen through the perspective of Robert Scott, they were genuinely out for more than glory in a way, or at the very least were out, but also understanding that there are things that are more important than putting a flag down. I would say what really sets them apart is that Amundsen was very methodical in his approach to how he was going to get to the South Pole. Remember, he had never been to Antarctica before. His previous experiences had been up around the North Pole, where he had taken time to observe the ways of the Inuits, and he was able to see how they traveled and how they dressed and adapt some of those practices into how he was going to approach Antarctica. Whereas Scott had been to Antarctica before, had his experiences with dogs, had his experiences with the clothing and some of the equipment that he brought along. But rather than committing to anything, just sort of tried a whole bunch of half measures, which ultimately was more of an impediment than a help. Yeah, I think when you think about traversing these sorts of environments, and this ties into what I was saying earlier about the hubris of it, you have two parties and one party recognizing that Perhaps people who are more familiar with the sort of climate who have acclimated to this, this environment would have some genuine wisdom to share. And you can kind of see that humility in the Norwegians going about it in that way and learning from the Inuit versus Robert Scott taking a moment to think not about how alternatively he could approach it, but specifically from his own perspective, from his prior trip to Antarctica, how he could fix things from that perspective. And... I'm not trying to be too critical of Robert Scott, but at the same time, you do have to wonder if somebody had thought to talk to the Inuit, if somebody had considered taking a moment, looking at alternative ways to approach this. I know we, we've talked about the dog situation before. Um, you do wonder at what point it could go differently. And this is really what we kind of started out with, with Anatomy of Disaster, is where's the moment? Where did they screw up, proverbially speaking? And there's a lot of different things you could point to. You could point to some of the depot caching. You could point to the, the dog situation, of course. You could point to the decision to try to rush back. There's There are many places where things have really taken a turn. But at the same time, I don't want to be too critical because at the end of the day, um, they realized their end far before it came. And I will say just on a personal note, it's a very difficult listen for me to listen to the lead into our segment where we kind of focus on music and telling more subjective experience, because you do have to think and realize that they had a lot of time to reflect on their legacy because they knew that their chapter was closing. It certainly was. And I think something else that I find interesting about this disaster is how it echoes what happened to the Franklin party. The fact that the weather was completely out of sorts for how it normally is during that time of year. And even in spite of how they planned, that was still an obstacle that simply could not be avoided. And that's true. There's so much of this that was just completely outside of the realm of anything any of us can control. And I find it interesting to think about specifically with Franklin, because these days the Northwest Passage is 
while difficult, not very altogether challenging, it seems. With the right equipment and with the right approach, it can be traversed. Now, of course, people are less interested and less enthused in it because it's been done before, so you have far less, you know, glory seeking going on in that neck of the woods. But at the same time, it's kind of that relationship man has with nature, right? Where the the desire to conquer something kind of outweighs the calculus that needs to happen and the humility in recognizing that just because last winter was one way doesn't mean this winter is going to be the same way. Yeah, very true. And that's always going to be true of nature, you know, whether we're dealing 100 years ago or today with people mountaineering. As good as you are going to plan, nature is going to take its course. And that's something you have to respect going into anything that you do. What I find fascinating about calculating the incalculable in that way is you see this hubris, you see this desire, this glory-seeking behavior to this day. I'm, I'm reminded of two different things. The first, of course, is the, the Titanic submersible that was on the news earlier this summer, where you had people who were trying to find a way to, shall we say, aesthetically innovate the deep sea exploration community, lacking an understanding of things like contiguous materials and basic safety protocol in the search of finding something that looks or sounds cool. Um, I, I think this kind of approach and demand for aesthetics is something that is emblematic a little more of our time than perhaps the past, but at the same time, I think you see this across history. But going for something for the glory, you know, in the past might have looked like a congressional award or a medal, and going for something for the glory these days might look like seeking approval and praise on social media or across a wide variety of platforms. You know, I don't think it's any surprise that you see these events continue, but at the same time, you see the tragedies continue. I'm also reminded, secondly, of K2, and if you're unfamiliar, and I know, Graham, I don't think we've spoken about this before, is now that Everest has its own industry behind it with Sherpas and travel guides and in many ways, you can simply pay your way to the summit. There's no longer a challenge in it. You see a lot of people shifting to a nearby peak, K2, the second highest peak, which is an immensely more difficult and more challenging climb. It is far more risky. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the fatality rate is like one in four to one in six. It's something immensely difficult. But at the same time, recently, I've seen these slick videos where people are going up to try to be the first to snowboard down K2. And, and I try not to come at it from a deeply judgmental level, although I do admit personally, it blows my mind the things people will do for aesthetic reasons or for recognition. But at the same time, it's just who we are. So it's an interesting thing to see how people are going to take their risks, and if the weather turns, and if the seas change, that could have fatal consequences. Yeah, and I think that's maybe another reason why we ended the series where we did, because big expeditions like this for obtaining a record really kind of started to come to an end. As colonialism sort of waned as a result of wars and increasing cost, uh, any expedition had to be utilitarian. You, you couldn't really just go into things, you know, for the glory anymore. And from that, you really began to see, you know, people didn't stop seeking glory. They just had to fund it themselves. They funded it with societies like the Royal Geographic Society, organizations that would, you know, enable them to go to the far corners of the globe and do something, you know, remarkable, like climbing a mountain or going deep into a cave. And that desire is always going to be with humanity. There's something rewarding about doing something or being somewhere that few people ever have. And the reason why few people ever have is because it's dangerous. I do find it remarkable, though, that there are industries built around things as dangerous as climbing Mount Everest or going down to uh, the Titanic. I think because of the way things sound, and this is kind of what I was speaking about earlier with, with aesthetics, I, I think perhaps the internet's age has illuminated it in a different light, but I don't think this is a unique thing to our time. And when I say aesthetics, what sounds better to the 19th century explorer than being the first to plant a flag on the South Pole? That sounds amazing. It feels like a great accomplishment, but it's not cognizant of the reality that Antarctica is a barren 
wasteland, for lack of a better term. We're talking about thousands upon thousands of miles to where there's no life, not no human life, no life of any kind, buried underneath thousands and thousands of feet of snow and ice, opening up into deadly crevasses. It's something to where it sounds very different saying it in London than it is to be there. But you know, I, and this is sort of something I was driving at at the end of the last episode is what I find really remarkable is the legacy that's come from polar exploration because the uses they wanted to have for the waterways or for the continent or whatever it was, they, they never got that. But as a result of all of those expeditions, all the people who died, we, it, it paved the way for us to have the ability to study the climates and understanding polar climates is very important to our understanding of the rest of the earth. You know, we do have research stations all along the Arctic Circle on Antarctica itself. So even though it didn't serve the purpose they set out for, it continues to be of vital importance today as a result of their sacrifice. And for whatever it's worth, um, I'll say that this was an area of history I didn't really know much about. I was never very interested in it. You know, when I think of people exploring the frontier, I think of, uh, you know, Lewis and Clark, Daniel Boone, that sort of a thing. The idea of people sailing into a frozen ocean and sitting there year after year, uh, freezing with very little to do. I, I just, I found the idea of that to be terribly boring. And I just never really gave it the attention it deserved, which I can say now. After having gone through this series, I think it does deserve attention. I think that the contributions that these explorers made, just as I said, carry with it a legacy. And personally, I just, I found it rewarding to really dig in and come to an understanding. It's interesting to think about because, and if I'm remembering my own personal history right, when we started this, I didn't have this individual I knew, but I now know someone who has taken the time to go down to McMurdo Station and work there the research. And it's fascinating for me to think about that because I know, you know, from his perspective, what it was like. And it's a very, very different experience these days to go down to Antarctica than, of course, it was for Robert Scott. At the same time, because of Robert Scott, because of these expeditions and these travels, that legacy is carried on to this day. Their understanding of Antarctica is always going to be influenced by their work. And while for many of them, the scientific component of their studies, of their expeditions, seem to, in many ways, be a lesser goal than the overall glory, good work was done nonetheless. And that is something that we do benefit from to this day. Yeah, you know, we, we only focus on the grisly parts of the history. We don't talk about the successes. Uh, we, we really didn't talk about much of the science involved. But there is a legacy of study and work that, uh, again, began with these first faltering steps down there. And perhaps at this point in history, you needed someone out for the glory in order to accomplish the scientific work that needed to be done. So in many ways, their sacrifices, while perhaps attempted for less than perfect purposes, were still net benefit to us all. I'm curious, what story did you find to be particularly interesting out of this whole series? I think the most interesting story, or rather the one that I was most enthralled by listening to, was probably the very first one. It was probably Anatomy of a Disaster, because there's something so visceral and so human about their experiences. While Antarctica is a cruel and very barren place, at the same time, you're on solid ground. You can lay down a sleeping cot and take a, take a rest, but when you're stranded out in frigid waters in the world's largest ocean, surrounded by nothing but water for presumably thousands of miles in every direction, and your only company being the deadly sharks that are targeting you and your fellow soldiers. There's something so immediate about that story. And also recognizing that the ends of the earth kind of transitioning into its own direction, while of course we didn't call Anatomy of a Disaster a part of the ends of the earth series, I think it was a very interesting precursor and Taking a look at everything we've done under the Grizzly History moniker, I think that was probably my favorite foray into this kind of story, into this type of narrative storytelling and understanding of what's happened. So what was your favorite episode? Of the entire podcast, I'd probably have to say the April Fool's Day episode. <laughs> Although, content-wise, I found the Arctic balloon expedition to be just fantastical. I mean, looking back today, obviously, you know, that's going to be a bad idea, but... 
I'm trying to think of it in its time. It's just such a unique idea. What if we just sailed a balloon over the North Pole? And I'm blown away that he convinced not just people to invest in it, but convinced himself that he could steer the balloon and that he could do it. But he really believed in what he was doing. And I, I just will always find that remarkable. But no, uh, uh, for just completely fun reasons, I just really enjoyed coming up with the April Fool's Day episode. It was a lot of fun to write. It was a lot of fun to record with friends. And yeah, that's probably always going to be my favorite. Yeah, I, I don't know if we've ever really talked at length about the April Fool's Day episode, but I think it was fun because we got to poke fun at a little bit of the kind of under underarching themes. You know, when you work on something like we have like this for a year and a half, call it gallows humor, but... You know, you start picking up on the different aspects of things, perhaps the, the ignorance of the, the traveling parties and the, the machismo that, that comes from, you know, a bunch of men getting on a boat and trying to do something wild. And and having a moment to kind of poke fun at that was was a bit of a catharsis for, for myself and I think for Graham as well. Um, what I find interesting, specifically going back to the Andre's air balloon expedition, is that's the one that I was reminded of first when I heard about the Titanic submersible, because to me, those are the most similar. That's the closest analog because you had two people who felt very strongly that their ability to innovate was just so superior to the way things have been done before, completely disregarding and not taking stock that, to be frank, almost every other authoritative voice of their day said, this is a doomed mission, but going for it anyway. And, you know, again, I, I don't want to come down overly harsh on Andre, but at the same time, it's it's just fascinating to see people go full bore into something despite everything. And, you know, it's sad that they're proven wrong in both cases. It's a calamity in either case, but it's kind of stunning, the bullheadedness. Yeah, it definitely is. And uh, that that is a good point to bring up. You know, I think the phrase goes, history doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. I wonder when we're going to hear the rhyme in space. Right. And, you know, we have a lot of things now where we have SpaceX and NASA talking about going back out to the to the moon, to Mars. And, and in many ways, this cycle kind of continues. Um, and in regards to the Earth, I think deep sea exploration is perhaps the last frontier we'll ever have on this planet. And, you know, I guess we're just hopeful that James Cameron will continue his research on that end. But otherwise, yeah, I think we're always going to be looking to the stars because there's just something about telling man that a place is untraversable. It really lights a fire in them. Yeah, there's just something that's always going to press mankind forward to go farther. You know, speaking of that, I think perhaps this is a good time to kind of transition into what we were talking about in regards to the future of grizzly history because something that i know both myself and grammar passionate about and what would most likely be our next chapter should we continue forward would probably be manifest destiny in the american frontier but what's kind of key and differential about what that perspective series would be as opposed to the earth is ends of the earth is about to me, in my own words, to summate it, mankind's conquering of nature versus the American frontier, in many cases, in many places, is man's desire to conquer man. Some of the stories that most fascinate me, and, and you know, don't hold me to this in the future if we do or don't tell these stories, is I think about the Lewis and Clark expeditions. I think about that kind of initial frontiersman attitude going into the mountain west and into the coasts. I'm also fascinated from a historical standpoint, from an exploration standpoint, the exodus of the Mormon community, the early proto-Mormon community, as they made their way over to Salt Lake City and over to Utah. I'm also interested to kind of delve into the relationships that we've had with Native Americans. And, you know, of course, there's the Trail of Tears, which I don't want to undersell any of the absolute tragedies and horrific things that were done to the Native peoples of, of this land we live on. But at the same time, I think the Trail of Tears is really just one shade of a greater story. I'd love to see more about the Battle of Little Bighorn. I'd love to see more about Custer's Last Stand. I'd like to hear more about those last vestiges taking place often in places like Wyoming and Montana and Utah, where kind of the, the last remnants of the original culture of this continent being taken away. Yeah, I really am... Uh 
fascinated that conflict existed from the very beginning, all the way from the first landing on the East Coast to the West Coast, and the idea of culture slipping away from people. Right. I think that with that sort of colonial aspect of American history, which kind of gets coincided with Reconstruction, the other great shame of this nation. If you're listening and if you take anything from this, I would encourage you to look into what happened in this country between 1860 and 1910. You might be surprised, but there is a reason we don't discuss this in our history books, is that this is a time where the pretext to genocide kind of fell flat. As Graham said, there was this idea that we needed to Americanize those who were native to this land, but the Cherokee are kind of the real proof that perhaps it was never about Westernization at all. Yeah, it's like a sociological tragedy of the commons, you know, I mean, you take an inch, eventually you'll take the mile. And I'm really interested in doing beyond series, just one-offs. I'm fascinated by the idea of the banality of evil, things like the Tuskegee experiments, things where atrocities are tightly controlled. It's not in the heat of the moment, but done methodically. And what I find really disturbing about it is just how people can rationalize that on a day-to-day -day level. I do think and something I did want to add here is with these stories, and there is a difficulty in approaching specifically American history more recent than, let's say, the Civil War, is the approach you have to take specifically with how you speak about it due to the current zeitgeist, the current Anthropocene, the political polarization, and what have you. You are all citizens, presumably, in this time, so you understand exactly what I'm referring to. But it, it really has very little to do with politics and with parties and with these sorts of things. The dehumanization of others is something that crosses every line there is. And with things like the Tuskegee experiments. And I'm reminded of the shorts we made with Grizzly History on TikTok and in other places, the Bopal disaster. It's really just easier than any of us would ever like to admit to dehumanize other people. And I would encourage you, if I could be so presumptuous as to encourage you, to think about that in the context of, of our modern era, of our modern polarization. Because I think you see that now with everyone, regardless of political belief or, or what have you, is I see a worrying trend of dehumanization. And I think part of the importance of history is to remind people what happens when we go down that path. Yeah, it is so easy to do. And it's so easy to think that you're exempt from it. But if you really slow down and listen to the way you refer to other people or the immediate thought that pops into your head about somebody, uh, you, 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 can, you can see it in little ways. But apart from talking about the themes of what future episodes could be, I think it's a good idea to talk about why we're pausing and uh, practically what the future might look like. You know, like, like Michael said, we were in different places two years ago. Career-wise, I was very seriously thinking I was going to transition out of my 9 to 5, get full-time into voiceover, and just pursue that full bore. That's definitely not the case anymore. Michael and I have become much more invested in our work, and unfortunately, we just have not been able to put episodes out at the pace that we want to. And with that in mind, we really want to give a lot of thought to how we would reapproach this. Because we, we don't want another two-year series. We want to create quality content at a consistent rate. Right. And I think in today's day and age, there is a pressure to not put a cap on things, right? We are cognizant of, of this sort of thing. We both work in marketing. And... We both have an understanding that with the internet, you have these additional things to kind of cultivate a brand and identity, right? So this is something we were approaching pretty intentionally, pretty transparently in my in my point of view. We had a Patreon. We wanted to try to launch this as something that was self-sustaining financially. And while I still think that's certainly possible, and while I'm endlessly grateful for the, the listenership and the viewership that we do have, those are things we can track. And it, it, it really does blow my mind that so many hundreds of people thousands of people actually have, have really listened to this series. What's important, I think, for myself and for Graham is to make something we're proud of. And we have slowed down significantly in our production because in order to make something that we are proud of, we simply have to give it time. And that is something that is, of course, in exceedingly little supply right now. So moving forward, while I'm very passionate about these series, I'd love to see us 
accomplish these things, I think we need to find a way to broach it more sustainably. And taking a moment to pause grizzly history, because for ourselves, you know, we're personal friends outside of this, but there's also the reality that for the past two years, it's been discussions about ends of the earth, very dark topics, as you can imagine. I think it's good for us to take a moment to make sure that we're putting out things that we're proud of and that we are concluding what we start, which is why, despite the fact that it might have taken far longer than we expected, it was really important for us to finish Ends of the Earth because we didn't want to leave you guys hanging. We do take it very seriously, the fact that we have a listenership, and we take personal pride in making sure that we finish what we start. Yeah, definitely. We uh, really cannot say thank you enough to those who have discovered us and stuck with us. Uh, It really has been remarkable. Michael and I both sincerely appreciate you continuing to tune in every episode. And bearing that in mind, we really want to give you something worth listening to. I think outside of this podcast, outside of, of this episode, you guys can all understand that these days, media, entertainment is all kind of distilled down into content. And while... I'm not necessarily fighting that wave. I do think we don't want to make content. I think we want to make something worth listening to. And not to divulge and demean those who are able to put out things. In many cases, they have the financial means or the time in order to keep up with the machine, with the algorithms. It's not something that we're able to compete with at this point in time. And we want to make sure that If and when additional episodes of Grizzly History come out, we're proud of it and we stand behind it 100%. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, You know, history shouldn't be a product. It's our stories. It's our heritage. And I think it should always be approached with respect. I do want to say, and I can attest personally, that many of our conversations and credit where it's due started by Graham is the importance to the fidelity to the truth. I can tell you From my perspective, Graham is agonized over making sure that the facts are the facts and that we're not just telling a story just to tell it, just to get it out there. And that's really important to us. And that's something that we're not going to sacrifice. And if that means that we're not going to make content, then, you know, so be it. And if that decision is, you know, frustrating for some, I understand that I would encourage you to go listen to Hardcore History or or many of the other podcasts out there, because while we're cognizant of the fact that this is a product, it's also our history. It's the story of who we are. And we've always taken that very seriously. And I think we will continue to do so. Yeah. And so that's why we're going to just pause things for now. But I would encourage you, there are a wide range of really good history podcasts out there, some which focus on brighter topics. So I would really encourage everybody to go out there, explore, find some good shows to listen to, and uh, just sit tight until we can put out another announcement. Yeah, and I think with the future of this podcast, it may look like one-offs, it may look like another series, it may not look like anything for a year or two. We don't know. And we're comfortable in not knowing. We hope that you're understanding of that fact. and. Again, we are endlessly appreciative of your time. If you're listening to this right now, towards the end of a bonus episode of a long series, I'm grateful for your time and your attention. I take it very seriously as both a person and as someone who considers marketing his career. Your time is valuable. Your eyes, your ears, your attention is something that everyone is after right now. And... I'm not going to take it unless I have something good to say. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely echo that. I think it's also worth noting that this podcast is not a whole lot of fun to be completely blunt about it. I don't think it's supposed to be. And I don't think, I don't think every podcast should be about fun topics. I don't think history has to always be bright and cheery, but I also acknowledge just as a person, you know, I I edit these episodes and Sometimes it is very emotionally taxing. To be honest, editing some of the more specific scenarios where we're reenacting the deaths of real people, like I, you have to stop and think about it and really make sure you're approaching it in the correct manner. Yeah, you don't want to sensationalize people's pain and suffering. You know, we we have made some choices with how we do the POV sections, but we have always tried to. Uh, respect the people there and just try to remind the audience that these were real people and uh, not just characters in a story. And I think, and I hope that I continue to be able to stand behind these POVs, but I really do because 
what we intended with them in that section of the podcast specifically was not to sensationalize, but rather force people in a way to understand what this must have been like. And it's one thing to describe what it is like to be on a ship that is hit by a torpedo or what it is like to traverse the endless deserts, icy deserts of Antarctica, but it's another thing to experience it. That was our intent. I sincerely hope that we have accomplished that intent, and I hope it stands to to be understood that we tried to approach these things with the reverence we think it deserves. But I think on that note, we're going to wrap up this episode and say goodbye for the time being. Wherever long that might be, I refer back to Jim Morrison. The future is uncertain, and the end is always near. But it's been a good journey along the way. Thank you for taking it with us. I'm Graham Parker. I'm Michael Ruiz. Goodbye for now. <laughs>